kidney care is an absolute disaster in this country, and there's nothing that can be done about it. Absolutely wrong. We could do more at home. We could take care of the patients. We could actually fix reimbursement. It's 1% of the Medicare population. It's 8% of the costs and rising rapidly. I'm tired of listening to you. Let's talk to an expert. I'm hearing crickets. Welcome to Care Talk, your incomparable home for incisive debate about healthcare business and policy. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. David, who do we have as a victim today? You know what I thought would be fun to talk about? Let's talk about some organs. How about the kidneys? We have a Cricket Health CEO, Bobby Sepucha, and he is going to talk to us all about the kidneys, the left kidney and the right kidney, John. It couldn't be more interesting. Why did you bring a lawyer to a medical conversation? I don't you? trust you, John. I know it's being recorded, but I need more protection than uh, than that. So let's let's ask him, Bobby. I mean, what's wrong with kidney care in America? Last I checked, everything was good. There are two companies. Each one does a good job. I think Fresenius works with the left kidney and DeVita works with the right kidney. And it's all, it's well, all good. Hey, 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 David, how about we start with the fact that Bobby is the CEO of one of the leading kind of new tech care platforms for kidney care, Cricket Health. Let's at least get through the introduction before we get to the insult. So yeah, Bobby, what's up with kidney care? Talk to us a little bit about how you got into this field and why Cricket, why now? Uh, Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And quite frankly, I could just listen to you guys go back and forth. This is fantastic. Um, Let's see, why kidney care? I um, had a, a different kind of career. I started out as a lawyer working with venture capitalists and high-tech startups, did a stint in DC uh, working for a congressman, and, and then ended up get it going to Fresenius, which is, as you guys know, one of the larger, uh, one of the two largest dialysis uh, providers. Spent eight and a half years there, had a wonderful time, wonderful people, but over time realized that uh, the incentives are all topsy-turvy. And we as a country, there are 36 million people suffering from kidney disease. There are a little over half a million of those folks who are on dialysis. And we spent all of our time, attention, focus, resources on that ha- those people on dialysis and none of the attention on the people upstream prior to kidney failure. So as a result, you have 90% of Americans with kidney disease who don't know they have it. The standard of care is they get close to kidney failure. They show up at a hospital. They don't know what's wrong with them. Uh, the doctor does a couple of tests and says, your kidneys have failed and you're on dialysis today and for the rest of your life. That struck me as a very backwards uh, system. Um, and the incentives are all topsy-turvy. So with the advent of value-based care, I think we have an opportunity to try and change it by going upstream. And that's what Cricket is all about. So engaging patients prior to uh, kidney failure, helping them understand their disease and give them the tools to make better decisions about their care. But even before then, I mean, if you think about the cost to Medicare, I think the last number I saw was about $90,000 a year for, that. that's just... Um, hemodialysis per patient per year. And that's not, you know, it's 28 billion. Um, transplant patient care is 3.4 billion. And they're all going up. And it would, with, a, with an increasingly obese uh, population and more and more people running into kidney problems, it's a massively high, massive high cost problem. And how, but how did you get into it? Why? What drew you to this, this, uh, this, this area? So I, I think, um, I guess, true confessions. I'm not sure I knew what a kidney was before I started Fresenius. And what I quickly quickly realized is that this is such a just a fascinating um, intersection of business, uh, medical, and policy. Um, back in 1972, when when dialysis was still relatively new unbelievably expensive and not accessible to the vast majority of people who who needed it. Congress did something that I suppose in retrospect looks unbelievably remarkable given our current state of political affairs, which is they stepped into the breach and did something remarkable. They said, if you're five or 65, if you're on chronic dialysis, you're eligible for Medicare. The government will pay for it. We want to make sure that people have access to this care. Um, and it saved millions of people's lives. It's It was truly remarkable. But to your point, I don't think anyone then understood either the cost of care on a unit cost basis, how that would accelerate, or just as important, if not more important, the sheer number of Americans who have hypertension, diabetes, therefore will develop kidney disease, and therefore, you know, the bulk of a lot of whom will go 
uh, go through kidney failure, need dialysis. So just the, the number of patients uh, metastasized in a way that no one could have expected. So you're right, we have this situation today where my favorite statistic that exemplifies what's so wrong, the dialysis population represents less than 1% of the overall Medicare population, but they account for more than 7.5% of the total Medicare spend. It is, if not the most expensive cohort in Medicare, it's certainly one of them. Um, and so you've got just this unbelievable challenge of how do you get these unit costs under control? And by the same token, you've got this wave of, of folks, we as a society can't seem to get ourselves off of Big Macs. And so you know that's gonna drive obesity, which is gonna drive diabetes, which is gonna drive kidney disease. It is a horrible, horrible cycle that we're in. Um, so when I got involved with uh, the, the kidney space, I was just enthralled how policy was driving business decisions, which was driving clinical uh, outcomes, which is probably the exact opposite of what you wanna have happen. Um, and so I think we have an opportunity now as we all try and figure out, all right, it's time to put more financial and clinical accountability on providers to do the right thing for patients, yes, but also the right thing for the system, that we have an opportunity maybe to to correct some of these um, these odd incentives that exist in the kidney care space. You know, Bobby, it could be it could be like a trivia contest. You know, on you say Medicare covers people over sixty five, the disabled, and what other thing? You know, end stage renal disease. You know, I'm not sure the the common person on the street would uh, would get that one. And it sort of sounds like yeah, you know, you're talking about well, no one could have foreseen what was going to happen. I bet if you know Medicare said instead they were not going to cover a dialysis, but they were going to cover let's say uh, you know cuts on the left arm, that that would have gone crazy too since 1972. So how much of it is just based on, you know, government trying to do the right thing and having you know, basically universal coverage for one condition? How much was that preventing a disaster? And how much was that just driving the market, given the way that this worked out here? I think it was clearly both. I mean, they, they prevented a disaster in the sense that up until 1972, I mean, in the wake of Obamacare, we heard all these horrible um, stories and, and, and scare tactics of, well, you're going to create death panels. Well, that's what we had in the late 60s and early 70s. If you had, if you're approaching kidney failure, whether it was in Seattle or Boston or anyone else, you had these panels of, of, of folks who were, um, you know, luminaries in their in their communities, whether it's uh, members of clergy or business people or or clinicians, sit together, look at fi uh, case files, uh, patient files, and literally decide who lives and who dies, who gets dialysis and who doesn't. So it was remarkable in the sense that it it gave people access to um, dialysis and let them, you know, took the financial component burden off of their shoulders. But by the same token, it clearly led to some um, topsy-turvy financial incentives where the dialysis providers realized, well, there's the pot of gold. It's all on dialysis. So Fresenius and DeVita did what any good um, entrepreneur does, I suppose. They said, let's gobble up every single dialysis clinic in the country. And that's what they've done in the last two years. So now you have a scenario where two companies control 77, 78% of all dialysis treatments in the country. But it's a pretty screwed up system from a patient perspective. Uh, I mean, it's it's a, di a center-based system treating patients like factors of production is not just somewhat dehumanizing, but you know, we, we, we lag the world in dialysis at home where the technology exists. And you'd think that the incentives exist and yet the 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 big two oligopolies, Davida and Fresenius, you were part of the one of the 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 dark duo olig oligopolistic dialysis providers that were fed by the uh, John, John, they, John, he said they were only bad in the last two years since he left. <laughs> the, the but the 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 track record of patients who get home dialysis, which is much less expensive, is that uh, more fewer patients die. Uh, because if you if you schedule dialysis, you know al along that production line phenomenon, there's a pretty big, pretty large period of time, and you can literally see the mortality rate go up in the time uh, for those who are, have an extended uh, delay or just scheduled time later. I, I, I'm sort of still stunned that you know, I think it's over seventy percent of the dialysis is done um, at home in Australia. It's like. 30 to 50% in some of the Northern European countries. And it's de minimis here. Like, isn't, isn't, is that the problem you're now trying to solve? Because it's, uh, it's, it's sort of scary. We're spending more and it's classic American healthcare, spend more, get less stock, go stocks go up. 
Bobby, I forgot to tell you that, that John is like a geography buff too. So he can also recite the uh, the rates in, in Lithuania uh, and Mongolia uh, as well. But uh, you don't <laughs> you don't hear much about in your dialysis anymore. Not as much as you should, clearly. Um, no, I think John, I think you raised the exact right point. And to me, it's in, in some respects, home dialysis is um, a, a symptom of a bigger problem. And it's and it's what we, we talked about a few minutes ago, which is, are you managing all of kidney disease or just dialysis, just post kidney failure. Because if you're managing all of it, then you help p- patients understand A, that they have the disease. You refer them to a nephrologist at a at the appropriate time, whether they're stage three or stage four, as they progress through the disease, so that the, when they do arrive at kidney failure, they are a better candidate for transplant. Um, and they've already been referred to a transplant center and are on the list. And the healthier you are, and the, the better you've managed your meds and your diet and your exercise, the better candidate you are for a transplant. That's the what, that, what. So just just to give us a sense of the problem, what percentage of the population crashes into dialysis as opposed to transitions? Yeah, and that's that phrase, crashing into dialysis, it, it exemplifies all that is wrong. What part of healthcare do you have a descriptor that you crash into it? Um, it's north of 65 percent. So you show up at so we're failing. We're failing almost seventy percent of the patients. Correct. As a system. Correct. So these people either don't know they have the disease, or if they do know they have the disease, they haven't seen a nephrologist, so they're not prepared. So they show up at the ER again, don't know what's happening. My, I've got chest pains. My, I've got blurred vision. What's happening? Oh, you're on dialysis. I'm going to plunk a catheter in your neck, which is the number one source for infection and the number one cause of hospitalizations um, after uh, dialysis starts. And the only choice you have at that point is in center dialysis. So as much as I like to point the finger at my former employer and, and DeVita, and yes, I was part of the problem for a long time. I was the head lobbyist, the guy walking the halls of CMS and Congress. Um, talking about more money. A nice job on the rates. Yeah, the, well, there was a lot of pressure on that a few years ago. I, 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 my, I was betting against you. Well, and man, you probably were right. Um, so you, when you have it prepared for it, your only option is in center dialysis. You don't even have the option to get a transplant or go home. Um, but so to me, it all flows from the same basic problem that we're not managing patients early. We're not working with them early because again, all of the money is in post kidney failure, just dialysis. But I thought all the all the nephrologists were already under pretty tight non compete and sort of sourcing contracts with the dynamic duo of Davida and Fresenius. For dialysis, yes, and and to be honest, when I, once I left Fresenius and went into you know trying to work with a startup who's trying to revolutionize kidney care, my biggest question was exactly that: How are we going to work with the, all of the nephrologists out there who already have these relationships with the di- dialysis providers? They're either medical directors at the DeVita Fresenius clinics or they're joint venture owners of these same clinics. So think about that, David, a system that is systematically incented to support the current infrastructure as opposed to better patient better patient care. Well, John, yeah, I'm not usually, you know, thinking is usually not part of my role here, but I will do that. And I also was going to say that, you know, all these problems I thought were solved. You know, the, the former president did two things. He tried to destroy democracy and he's upended the kidney care system, which is, I think, is now all fixed because of this, right? Well, I actually think that President Trump's CMMI was trying to move kidney care in the right direction. And at some point, we're going to let Bobby talk about where he's going as opposed to where he's been. But I think understanding how screwed up and how tightly tightly struck tightly locked in we are to a dumb system is is it helps kind of prepare the ground for because for Bobby's company cricket which which I'm really excited to learn about at some point during this podcast and some of the other uh, uh, alternative care models because whatever we do we can't repeat we're doing that we're failing some of the sickest people in America it, it is remarkable but I will say there is uh, and maybe I'm a uh, hopeless naive optimist, but there, I think there are signs of, uh, there's reason to be excited. One is the doctors, even though, again, they're so aligned with the dialysis providers for dialysis. Um, we have actually struck, uh, struck a bunch of partnerships with pra- large practices across the country, um, almost all of whom are aligned somehow with the two big folks on dialysis. They want to work with us in chronic kidney disease pre-kidney failure. So they realize that there should be a better way of doing things. There should be a better way of engaging patients. And they're working with us to build networks to do more and to go to payers and take more risk on uh, doing better things for chronic kidney disease patients. So now that you're looking for absolution, what exactly are you doing at at, at Cricket? So the model is, uh, yes, I get down on my knees and I thank 
the good Lord every day that I get to uh, try and try and uh, do something better for kidney patients. But in in all seriousness, the the model is working with payers and systems. So going to large payers like Blue Shield California uh, or Cigna and saying, we will take risk on your population. Let us work with your late stage chronic kidney disease patients. We will enroll them in our platform. So every single patient gets their own dedicated care team, a nurse, a dietitian, a social worker, a pharmacist, a patient peer mentor that they can interact with over our platform anytime they want. So there's a rich library of content that they get to immerse themselves in. And then our, our care team can see that and engage the patient, say, Mrs. Jones, I see you've been reading about home dialysis. Would it help for you to talk to a patient who's been on peritoneal dialysis at home for the last five years? So by doing that, by engaging patients- with you like bunch Facebook, of- like you're creepily wandering through people's searches and figuring out what their interests are? I'm tired of those sneaker commercials, by the way. John, ob- ob- objection. I think the word creepily is uh, is not even a word. And also, it's not it's it's not neutral, you know? They do have the social Why media. not neutral? It's even worth it. John, it's- How do you, how do you, but just seriously, Bobby, how do you identify, you know, the, it's obvious when someone's really sick and they've got a diagnosis and they, and they need care, they're, they're in failure, which is what crashing means. But upstream, you know, chronically ill people- folks who are obese, uh, uh, pre-diabetic, or actually early onset diabetes, how do you then I, you know, sort of figure out who you're going to reach out to and what you're going to do? So if you go too far upstream into stage one, stage two kidney disease, or even before that sort of pre-kidney disease, it's going to take too long for them to progress for us to have any meaningful impact on them. They're better served, quite frankly, working with their primary care docs, uh, and we will leave that to them. As they start to progress towards the disease, we can certainly, if they're a claim, they have a claim for kidney disease, they've been diagnosed, terrific. But as we've talked, there's so many who are underdiagnosed. So we've developed algorithms where we can ident- we can mine their claims uh, it, with, through the insurance company and identify those who we can predict with a 90% accuracy, not only if they have the disease, but what stage they're at. So that's then we reach out to these folks, enroll them in our in our platform, and start to provide the care that we we can do. Um, you know, you mentioned that, so. That, that is the side working with commercial plans, MA plans, and I think we've been very successful and have a strong track record for sort of building in the future. The other thing you guys mentioned was the, the, the initiatives of the Trump administration to try and extend these same types of arrangements for the Medicare fee-for-service population, which was a massive step forward and is slated to go into effect uh, this January. You guys like to be, you sort of mix it up and be a little uh, edgy. I, I will say the risk of diving into politics, the thing that I'm most encouraged by is that the dirty little secret of DC is that there is way more than Democrats and Republicans agree on with respect to health care than they disagree. The, ne- the notion of moving towards value and to um, give more clinical and financial accountability to providers, I think there's widespread consensus that's where we need to go. And especially with respect to k- kidney care, as much heft as my former employer has and DeVita has in terms of political giving, I think people recognize that the duopoly has not served tens of millions of Americans. And it's time to do something different. And I give the agency CMS an awful lot of credit. And that's what they're trying to do. I think we agree with you that there's less there's less daylight between Brad Smith and Liz Fowler, the different heads of CMMI, and and um, that, that that makes a lot of sense. I guess my question though is, how does your model work? You're 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 taking. The, the insurance companies are looking to obviously downstream risk to anybody. That's something we at CareCentrics know. What are you doing differently other than predicting who's going to get uh, have, have kidney challenges? What are you doing differently with the patients that allow them to you know, really live their best lives and manage that illness? What's, dif- what, what, what's different than what they would normally get from a great you know, internist and nephrologist? So part of it is that this, and this is a sad commentary in our health healthcare system, is that they're just wildly unmanaged. So almost any care we give them is going to be an improvement. Being able to speak to them in their native language and help them understand their disease is, is a massive improvement. But I think even if you have a wonderful nephrologist and a wonderful set of care managers at that nephrologist, you're only going to the, see them on an appointment basis, once a quarter, twice a year, maybe. So we get to be the 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 doctor's eyes and ears between appointments. So again, what we're seeing in our most recent launch in Texas is that our patients are interacting with our clinicians every two or three days, so 10 times a month. So again, it's this immersive experience for patients so they can read and understand much more about their disease, 
talk to clinicians on a fairly constant basis. So the next time they go to their docs, they're far better informed, far better engaged, and can start ma- making better decisions. Um, that in and of itself has led to, we're seeing our patients uh, start at home uh, three times the national average. So you know, we have a 12 or 13 uh, percent home penetration in this country. Uh, patients, once they go through the Cricket platform and work with our clinicians, uh, they, they're starting at dialysis, home dialysis uh, to the tune of about 36, 37 percent. So it's been it's been terrific what we've seen thus far. And we're excited to keep growing. Bobby, what role does transplant play? We've been talking about sort of pre-dialysis and then dialysis, but where, what's the role of, you know, of, of transplant? What's the potential? I, so clearly transplant is the gold standard in terms of care. Um, if you can get a transplant, you don't have to deal with dialysis. That is what where everybody wants to go. I think our big challenge is that there's just a dearth of kidneys. Talk about a complex problem to try and figure out. Uh, there aren't enough organs out there. On a, At any given day, you've got 100,000 Americans on the transplant waiting list to get a kidney. Um, so clearly we have to figure out that and the government has, has launched a, a massive program to try and increase the number of kidneys that are available. Um, but the other piece is trying to make sure all the transplant centers are talking to each other because there's widely different standards. So those are big, hairy, ugly problems that need you know, we need a, a nationwide response to. But the other piece from just from a blocking and tackling perspective is making sure that every patient uh, is referred to a transplant center timely. You don't have to wait until your kidneys have failed to be referred. You can go early to get a, uh, try and get a preemptive transplant. And as we said earlier, you're only going to be accepted off the waiting list if you're uh, healthy enough to actually receive the kidney. So you help, you know, you got to help have help managing your meds and making sure your, um, your, your diet is, is where it should be and you're exercising. And that's what uh, we, we empower and help patients be able to do. Well, as you could tell before, John's big on Facebook and some of the other social networks, including some that are you know less popular and uh, maybe he's not allowed to be on. I don't know. But you do have a social media element to what you're doing. Is, is that true? John wasn't just talking nonsense. No, it's a huge component of it. And it sounds soft and squishy, but to us, it's incredibly important. It's frankly part of our DNA. Um, it is about putting patients in touch with others. So yes, it's you have a patient peer mentor who can engage with you as part of your care team. But the other thing that we do is we create communities of patients online through our virtual platform so that patients can get together and discuss the issues that are important to them, whether that is understanding their disease or figuring out home dialysis or likelihood for transplant, whatever the issues are, where they can get together and talk. And that's often as we sort of watch these these conversations, that's when the light bulb really goes off for patients. And it's why our patient engagement has been so high. Uh, and why our retention is so high to the t- to the tune of ninety percent today. So we are thrilled with that. What's what goes on in those dialogues, and they're all monitored and curated by our clinicians, so we can correct if there's any um, you know mistake made or, or or misinformation conveyed to patients. So they're getting top flight information from each other, and that is what really uh, I, again empowers patients to make much better decisions about their care. Yeah, there's a bunch of little companies that are taking on this big problem you know, Strive, Somatis, Cricket, and others. What's different about your approach, other than the odd name, that would make a health plan or a doc want to kind of uh, partner with Cricket to help the hundreds of thousands of people who have kidney disease and don't even know it? Yeah, I think it's two big things. One is we have the results. Uh, We were very thoughtful and intentional about how we went to the market. And we ran a long uh, pilot program with a health system up in the Pacific Northwest where we cared for their patients uh, at no cost to prove that the clinical model works and that patients would be willing to engage over our platform. And as a result, we have results. Uh, as as I said earlier, you know, patients three times more likely to start dialysis at home. They're twice as likely to start dialysis in an outpatient setting. And that's what Blue Shield in California and Cigna and Scott and White in Texas saw, and that's why they signed us up. So one is a strong track record of actual results that are peer reviewed and published. The second piece is this uh, this notion of patient engagement. Uh, we have unlocked that to a, in a way that I don't think other competitors have even started to think about. Certainly not the dialysis providers. Um, the this intentional focus on community, fostering relationships of trust with the clin- clinical care team, but also with and among other patients. Um, that's why our patient satisfaction scores are at ninety four percent. That's why. Is it sort of like a patients like me model where people it's, share? And it's compare? remarkably similar on the social media side, sort of community based side. It's it's once patients understand that they're not alone, that they're in this together, and that there are other people who have grappled with the same issues. Um, it's 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 really fascinating to watch how that changes things. 
That, that's super helpful, Bobby. And I'm, 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 I'm excited about what you and frankly, everyone else is trying to do to blow up the current screwed up system because it really is devastatingly bad for us as taxpayers and, and, and much more importantly for all of those vulnerable, chronically ill people. I really, I wish you all success. David, I'm, I'm sorry that you waited so long to let Bobby join our program. I think he's actually done an okay job, regardless of what you said before he came on. All right. Well, John, well, that's it for another edition of Care Talk. And of course, John, I agree with everything you said, except that cricket is a weirder name than somatis. I don't know where you got that idea from. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. If you like what you heard or didn't, please give us feedback and subscribe. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, Bobby.